and welcome back to my channel. Today we're going to have a look at the 2023 National 5 Multiple Choice section. I'm going to go through each question and show you how to find the answers. Question 1 relies on you knowing the equation for average rate. You can find this at the front of your data book. The equation is average rate equals change in quantity divided by change in time. In the question you're given information, the rate is 5 centimetres cubed per second and the time is 60 seconds. We need to rearrange the equa equation for change in quantity. This will come out to be average rate multiplied by time. We can then insert the numbers from the question. We have 5 centimetres cubed per second multiplied by 60 seconds. The units will cancel out. The per second and the second will cancel, leaving us with units of centimetres cubed. The answer will be 300 centimetres cubed, which is D. Question 2 is testing your knowledge of subatomic particles. There are three subatomic particles, protons, neutrons and electrons. Protons and neutrons are found in the nucleus, and electrons are found outside the nucleus. Both protons and neutrons have a mass of 1. Electrons have no mass. Protons have a positive charge, and neutrons have no charge. Electrons have a negative charge. The answer to 2 is A. Question 3 is looking at the shapes of molecules. A will form a tetrahedral shape. This is because the central atom will form four bonds. B will form a trigonal pyramidal shape. This is because the central atom will form three bonds but also has a lone pair of electrons. C will form an angular shape. This is because the central atom will form two bonds but has two non-bonding pairs and D will form a linear shape. When looking for a molecule which will form an angular shape, look out for molecules with a central atom from group 6 such as oxygen or sulphur. In this case our answer is C. Question 4 is looking at the structure of different bonding. We're looking for this representation of lithium fluoride. Lithium fluoride is an ionic compound. This means that it will be made up of a lattice of alternating positive and negative ions. Picture A represents metallic bonding, positive ions in a sea of delocalised electrons. Picture B represents ionic bonding. Picture C so shows covalent molecules and picture D shows a covalent network. Therefore B is the answer. For question 5, we're looking for the compound with iron with a 3 plus charge. For using your data book, you need to look at page 6 for the electron arrangements of the non-metallic elements and page 8 for group ions. When trying to work out which of these compounds has iron with a 3 plus charge, you need to consider what the charge of the negative ion is. Overall, the compound has no charge. Therefore, the charge of the negative ions and the positive ions must be equal. If we look at iron oxide, oxygen has a charge of 2 minus. This means that the iron will be 2 positive. For iron phosphide, phosphorus has a charge of 3 minus. Therefore, iron in this compound will have a charge of 3 plus. For the group ions, you'll find their charge on page 8. Here we have two nitrate ions, so 2 minus the iron will be 2 plus. In iron phosphate, we have two phosphate ions, each with a charge of 3 minus, so that is 6 minus overall. There are three iron ions, which will be equal to 6 plus. If we divide this by 3, each of them will have a charge of 2 plus. Therefore, iron phosphide is the answer. For question 6, we need to do moles equals concentration times volume for each of the answers. For A, we will have 1 times 0.1. Remember to turn all of your volumes into litres. This will give an answer of 0.1 moles. For B, we'll have 0.75 times 0.15. This will give an answer of 0.1125 moles. For C, we'll have 0.6 times 0.2, which is 0.12 moles. And for D, we have 0.25 times 0 0.25, which is 0 0.0625 moles, making D our answer. 
For question 7, we're looking for the substance which, when shaken with water, would cause the pH of water to increase. We need to have a look at page 8 for solubility. For the pH of water to increase, we need to have a metal oxide which is soluble. This means that we can eliminate C and D as they are both non-metal oxides. This then leads us to look at the solubility of aluminium oxide and barium oxide. Aluminium oxide is insoluble and therefore will not change the pH of water. Barium oxide is soluble and would cause the pH of water to rise. In question 8, we're looking at the reactions between nickel carbonate, nickel hydroxide and nickel metal with dilute sulfuric acid. We need to find the statement which is true for all three reactions. When nickel carbonate reacts with sulfuric acid, you'll produce carbon dioxide, a gas. When nickel hydroxide reacts with sulfuric acid, it does not produce a gas. It produces nickel sulfate and water. Nickel metal would produce hydrogen gas. When nickel carbonate and nickel hydroxide react with sulfuric acid, they both produce water, but this does not happen for nickel metal. All three reactions will produce nickel sulfate, and for nickel on its own, it is not a neutralisation reaction. Therefore, C is the answer. In question 9, we're trying to emit the spectator ions. Spectator ions are those which do not change at all from reactant to product side of the reaction. In this case, sodium ions are spectators, as are chloride ions. They remain as sodium and chloride ions in the aqueous state. This means that the reacting ions are your carbonate ions with hydrogen ions to produce water and carbon dioxide. For question 10, it's best to draw this out in full. From there, we can name the molecule as you usually would. Number the chain from the end closest to the branches. This is going from right to left on this molecule. Here we can see that we have five carbons all joined with single bonds. This means that the name is based on pentane. We can eliminate C and D as they are based on pentene. We then have three branches, two methyl branches on carbon 2 and one methyl branch on carbon 4. This means that the name will be 2,2,4-trimethylpentane, which is A. For question 11, we're looking for the isomer of 2-methylbutuene. Isomers have the same molecular formula but different structural formula. In this case, the molecular formula is C5H10. So the first place to start is to look for molecules with the formula C5H10. A has the formula C5H10, B is C5H12, C is C5H10, and D is C6H12. This means you can eliminate B and D immediately. A is the same structure as the given formula, it's just been flipped over whereas cyclopentane is the isomer. For question 12, we're looking at addition reactions. Start by drawing out the structure of butuene. Addition reactions will happen at the central two carbons. This means that A would happen if you added on hydrogen. B cannot happen because the OH is on the end carbon, whereas C and D have had the OH add onto the middle carbons and the BRs add onto the middle carbons. Therefore, B is not possible. For question 13, we're looking at a problem-solving question. You've been given an example of a possible reaction. You need to have a look and see what is happening in this reaction. We can see from the product that we have the CH3 from the left-hand molecule and the C2H5 from the right-hand molecule, both joined to a C double bond O. This means that the OH from both of the molecules and one of the C double bond Os has been removed. This has then formed the carbon dioxide and water. We've then been given reactants. You need to do the same removal and then join together the parts that are left. This means that A will be your answer. For question 14, we're comparing methanol and octanol. Let's start by writing out the formulas for methanol and octanol. Methanol has a formula of CH3OH. Octanol has a formula of C8H17OH. Methanol is significantly smaller than octanol. This means that its formula mass will be lower. This also means that its solubility will be higher. 
this means that D will be the answer. For question 15, we're looking at the two molecules. It says that you may wish to use your data book to help you. This will be for the melting points which are mentioned in B. First of all, we need to identify what the molecules are. The molecule on the left is butane, whereas the molecule on the right is cyclobutane. Butane is part of the alkane family and has a general formula of CnH2m plus 2, whereas cyclobutane is part of the cycloalkane family with a general formula of CnH2n. Therefore, A is not the answer. If we have a look at their boiling points on page 9 of your data book, then you will find that butane has a boiling point of negative 138 and cyclobutane is negative 90. Alkanes and cycloalkanes are generally insoluble in water. However, both molecules contain only carbon to carbon single bonds, making them saturated. For question 16, we're looking at the production of sodium methanoate. Sodium methanoate is a salt and therefore produced in a neutralisation reaction with an acid. You can eliminate A and D as they do not contain acids. Sodium chloride from B is a salt so will not react, whereas sodium oxide is a base and will. For question 17, we're looking at the properties of metals. In general, metals have high melting and boiling points. Therefore, we can eliminate B. They also conduct electricity as both solid and liquid. Therefore, A is the answer. For question 18, we're looking at metal reactivity. We want to put the metals in order of increasing reactivity. This means we need to find the least reactive metal. This will be Y as it does not react with acid or water. We then need to find the most reactive metal, which is Z as it reacts with oxygen, acid and water. This gives us B as our answer. For question 19, we're looking at electrochemical cells. We have two metals joined together in an electrochemical cell, A and B. The electrons are flowing from A to B. This means that metal A is more reactive than metal B. You're to use the data book to help you. You want to look at page 10, the electrochemical series. The metal which is higher up is the metal which is more reactive. If we compare the options A and B that are given in the table, then we'll find that aluminium is more reactive than nickel, and therefore D is the answer. For question 20, we're trying to write an overall redox equation. For the two equations given, you need to turn one of them over. The one which is more reactive is the one which will be flipped over and will be oxidised instead of reduced. This is the magnesium equation. You also need to have an equal number of electrons, which means you need to multiply the silver equation by 2. If we rewrite out the equations so that they are in the correct order and with the correct number of electrons, we can then cancel the electrons when we join the two equations together. It is the overall redox equation. Question 21 looks at industrial processes. The Haber process produces ammonia. The Oswald process produces nitric acid. The Haber process uses nitrogen to produce ammonia. In question 22, we're looking at radioactive decay. An alpha particle is a helium nucleus with a mass of 4. If we start off with thorium of the mass of 27 and we eventually get to lead with a mass of 211, we can work out what the missing mass is by doing 227 minus 211. This gives us 16. If each alpha particle has a mass of 4, we can divide by 4 to find that we must have lost 4 alpha particles. For question 23, we're looking at precipitation reactions, which is where we produce a solid from two aqueous solutions. Page 8 has the solubility table. We're looking for something which is soluble, as this would not be able to be formed by a precipitation reaction. Barium sulfate is insoluble, as is lead sulfate. Calcium chloride is soluble, and silver chloride is insoluble. Question 24 is a problem-solving question, where you're given lots of information about different tests, and then the results of said tests on a mixture. The page 6 in your data book will help you with flame tests. For the mixture, the Benedict's test goes from blue to orange. This means that there is glucose present. The iodine test has no change. This means that there is no starch present. A flame test showing yellow would be sodium. 
This means that the mixture must contain glucose and sodium chloride from the options available. Question 25 is a titration calculation. You've been given the balanced equation and we're to calculate the number of moles to neutralise the acid. We have 0.002 moles of sulfuric acid. For every mole of sulfuric acid, we require 2 moles of sodium hydroxide. As we only have 0.002 moles of sulfuric acid in the solution, we're going to multiply this by 2 to get 0.004 moles of sodium hydroxide. This gives B as the answer. Thank you for watching my video. I hope that you find it helpful. Please remember to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified of new videos. You can also follow me on X at Miss Adams Chem, Instagram at Miss Adams Chemistry, and now TikTok Miss Adams Chemistry. Bye for now.